Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. Today is Tuesday, October 11th, 2022. And today is the day that Tulsi Gabbard has decided to exit the Democrat Party. Very interesting start to today's um, to today's uh, news cycle. Tulsi Gabbard, of course, you'll remember, was at one time vice chair of the DNC, which is, you know, not necessarily that key of a role. A lot of those times, those are just um, honorifics. Those are usually run by professional uh, by professional offices, you know, executive directors and that sort of thing. But still was clearly tipped for some sort of progress within the Democratic Party uh, with that appointment. She ran for president or the, uh, the Democratic presidential nomination, I should say, in 2019, had a couple of very good debates, managed to uh, de-pants Kamala Harris, not once, but twice in those debates, absolutely shred her and um, expose her as an intellectual lightweight and um, didn't quite uh, score a knockout blow on anybody else, but uh, came to Joe Biden's defense in at least one of those cases. She was defending Joe Biden from Kamala Harris's charge that he was uh, a, a racist, or at least the implication that Joe Biden was a racist and uh, was fairly angry about that. Um, three years later, she's saying the whole, um, the whole party is racist. It is run by, and I'm going to quote here, an elitist cabal of warmongers driven by cowardly wokeness. Uh, now she's got a new podcast. Uh, it's about 28 minutes long. It's embedded at, um, at, at in my post at uh, hotair.com, obviously. And, uh, so you can listen to her whole, uh, her whole litany of complaints about the Democratic Party, but she scores a number of these points, including the Department of Justice's weaponization against pro-life uh, protesters uh, and parents who are objecting to uh, extremist radical curricula in local schools. Um, and then conversely, the fact that they haven't lifted a finger to stop illegal protests outside Supreme Court justices' houses, even though it expressly violates federal statutes. Uh, so that's among the litany of complaints, but basically her, her issue with the Democrat party is that is, is the wokeness is the fact that they are uh, stoking racial divisions rather than trying to heal them and that they have become a party of extreme elites rather than the working class, which is what her perception of the Democratic party was when she, when she first signed up and got politically active. Now, I'm not necessarily sure that she's becoming a Republican either, although I think she, you know, for the last three years has made it pretty clear that she probably fit better in sort of the Rand Paul wing of the GOP. Um, that may come. And I didn't glean out of her podcast today whether or not that that was something that was coming soon, coming at all. I think that uh, her point is that she really just wants to work as a independent voice now in in media and... In, in her podcast, certainly. And, you know, given her platform of uh, having previously been in the uh, House of Representatives and having been, you know, DNC vice chair and the uh, 2019 Democratic presidential primary, is my guess is that her podcast is going to be very popular, especially on the right in the next couple of weeks. Um, we'll see if, um, if she's got any um, uh, criticisms to level at the GOP. Uh, I'm going to say... You know, hold your powder on this one. Keep your powder dry, I should say. You know, hold your fire. Um, because I'm not sure where she lands here now after this. If she is going to be uh, somebody who does a pox on both parties. Um, you know, in the past, she's kind of edged up to, um, I would say, edged up to Putin's sympathy in, in the past. I think she was a little unschooled in that. And I think she recovered from it. But it'd be interesting to see just how far she is going to go in terms of isolationism, in terms of criticizing what the U.S. is doing in Ukraine or doing for Ukraine, and and so on. And what she has to say about NATO, what she has to say about the EU, all of that's kind of on the table. And I would say let's let's hear her out. Let's see what you know. Let's see where she lands. Um, and I think that that would probably be. Good idea when we're talking about anybody who is a sudden convert to the cause. And I have a fairly lengthy post today about Kanye West, who I really honestly have 
almost no interest in. I was really sort of relieved to not be writing about him in July of 2020 after his, you know, two week flirtation with jumping into a presidential election with absolutely no organization on the ground, clearly not comprehending how you run for president, uh, let alone, you know, how you, how you raise money and all that. I mean, just literally the nuts and bolts of it is you have to qualify for the ballot in all 50 states or at least enough states to matter. And that means you have to have people on the ground in all 50 states. This is not just something you can do with a GoFundMe. And I don't think Kanye West understood that at the time. I think when he, you know, I think after a couple of weeks, he got some PR value out of it and decided he was going to uh, give it a rest. And then lately, of course, he was back in the news with uh, some statements on Black Lives Matter, which certainly pleased people on the right. And it's and it's tempting when celebrities who normally you think would disagree with you suddenly become converts. And I get that. I get that impulse. And and look, I mean, I think that, you know, I think that you can defend people um, on that basis to an extent, but you really should know who, you know, what you're what you're getting into bed with. Um, and I think that we missed that opportunity on the right. Some of us missed that opportunity on the right. So I have a rather lengthy post about that. Um, and I would say that Tulsi Gabbard's much more of a known quantity, by the way, in politics. So, I mean, it's not like we're suddenly going to think that she's going to fly off and do something, you know, radically embarrassing. But I would say it's still a good, it's, it's still good to just let things unfold and to maybe cheer the argument rather than the person for a while until we know a little bit more about the person. Um, all right. David Strum's got a great post up today. Great VIP post up today. High speed rail exists solely for graft. <laughs> We've been talking about this ever since California's, you know, uh, choo-choo project got started. Was it a, a, a decade ago? I'm talking about the impossibility of this, talking about how, how corrupt it was just from the beginning, how corrupt it was and how the prices were so ridiculously low in estimation that you just knew that this thing was just going to balloon out of control. And we still don't have <laughs> a bullet train, even after all this time, uh, because of the graft and because of everything that David talks about. So be sure to check that out. Great post there. Um, Beach has a good post up today. Boom, boom, out go the lights. You should check that one out about the energy crisis in, um, in Europe. I have a post up taking a look at why Belarus all of a sudden is allowing Russian troops to, to congregate on the border of Ukraine in the north. Uh, this is sort of second front tactics from, from Putin. Um, but Lukashenko has a lot to lose here, no matter what he does, which is the reason why I think he's kind of stuck. And uh, so I talk about that a little bit. I talk about the fact that neither the Belarusian troops nor the Russian troops that are going to be on that border are particularly um, threatening. Uh, they're mostly going to be conscripts in both, in both uh, senses. The Belarus military has never been battle tested at all. It's barely a military. It's more like an internal security force to keep Lukashenko in power. And it's, its primary military value was basically a defensive screening force uh, that relied on a supposedly expert Russian military uh, to back it up. And now not only has the Russian military not proven expert, it's in the process of being dismantled in Ukraine. Still, Ukraine's going to have to dedicate some resources back to the north. I don't know how many that they've got in, in reserve. Um, you know, that includes some artillery pieces that they'd probably prefer to have in, you know, places near, you know, uh, Svatova and uh, Lysychansk um, and Kremina. But not to mention Kherson, but, um, but they're probably going to have to do that. They probably were doing it anyway. Um, and I, I, because after the first thrust at Kiev, They've probably kept some forces up there just to make sure that uh, Russia doesn't have any more ambitions towards the north at the moment. But that puts, you know, Alexander Lukashenko in sort of a difficult position, especially <clears throat> in relation to his uh, EU relationships and the sanctions that are, are going to follow. The EU and France specifically have already threatened that. Um, there's already been some missile lobbying uh, out of Belarus into Ukraine. And the Ukrainians are warning that um, uh, Belarus risks um, a conflict unless they uh, put an end to that. 
So that's a little bit more brinksmanship. Um, Putin clearly needs a second front to try to distract from the uh, counteroffensives that Ukraine has launched in the south and southwest, uh, or I should say the south and southeast, actually. And ISW has a really good uh, read on that, so I included a, uh, an excerpt of their assessment of that situation. Um, all right. Other than that, I mean, we've got some other great stuff coming up. I take a look at the Ohio uh, debate last night. Uh, did J.D. Vance close the close the sale last night? I actually think that based on the reactions I'm seeing, because I didn't watch the debate, based on the reactions I'm seeing is that J.D. Vance held his own and that's all he really needed to do. Just like Blake Masters in Arizona. All he really needed to do was hold his own. So stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for uh, Andrew Malcolm, the prince of Twitter, coming up after this. I'm Ed Morrissey. Thanks for watching. Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. As always, on Tuesdays, we talk to the prince of Twitter, the regent of redstate.com, <laughs> Andrew Malcolm, at AH Malcolm on Twitter. Of course, redstate.com. This is where he's a regent. And Andrew, welcome back. As always, Thank great you. to talk with you. Thank you. Good to be here, sir. You know, we talk a lot about media bias and, you know, you know, media spin and that type of thing. And uh, I, I, you know, we, I, I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to try to uh, snow anybody. You and I started talking about this just before we started recording this. And I said, we got to get this on tape. I mean, this is, this is right up our alley. This New York magazine um, profile of John Fetterman in Pennsylvania is at least according to their Twitter feed, something to be seen, to be believed. I mean, this is crazy. And I, you know, Andrew, I can't access it because it's behind their firewall and I, I don't subscribe to New York magazine and I'm not inclined to anyway, um, which is fine. We have subscriptions too. Everybody's got subscriptions. They're all fine. I just, I can't access it. Normally I wouldn't criticize something that I haven't read or that I haven't seen. Right. You know, it's just like trying to right. criticize a movie that you've never watched. That's bad form. Right. Right. But you can still do it. Yeah, you can still do it. <laughs> However, I'm just going to go off of what New York Magazine itself tweeted out about John Fetterman, because this is astounding to me. When was the last time that you heard a journalistic organization say about a politician that he had attained folkloric stature? <laughs> <laughs> in their own minds <laughs> folkloric stature from what <laughs> the guy was the guy was mayor of braddock which is you know it's it's not a nothing but it's hardly legendary um there have been other mayors of braddock um and then he's been lieutenant governor and barely showing up for that the associated press uh reported last week that the guy was missing for about a third of the time he's supposed to be showing up. And even on the days he's supposed to be working, he's putting in four or five hours and, and then chucking it. Um, <laughs> I don't know what kind of folklore that is. Um, maybe well, he's, maybe he's following, he's following Joe Biden's example. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe it's sort of that folklore of dude, where's my car? You know, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, he's getting I, another tattoo. Yeah. And again, tattoos are a bad of taste. If you want tattoos, feel free to go out and get tattoos. And the reason why they're doing this is because they are trying to argue, okay, that Fetterman defied the right wing caricatures of the contemporary left is as elite, effete, and out of touch because he was self evidently none of those things. Um, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to call him a feat. The guy's huge, right? Yeah. <laughs> the guy's huge. He's got, you know, his physicality is undeniable. And, you know, he also chased a black man down, an innocent black man down with a shotgun because he was running through his neighborhood in 2013. Uh, that's not exactly a feat. It's also not exactly the type of thing that you'd get away with if you were a Republican. <laughs> oh, no, of course not. Remember, Bill Cosby had a line. He got in trouble, too. But Bill Cosby had a line one day. Someone asked him about working out, and he said, "Really, a black man running down the streets of Beverly Hills?" <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, Fetterman sort of proved that true in Braddock, right? I mean, yeah. And um, so, 
uh, at any rate. Uh, just to, just to move on from that, but uh, as elite, would you call somebody that graduated from the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government with a master's degree elite? Just I'm curious. Did, would you consider that elite? No, I consider them rich. <laughs> well, his parents <laughs> were rich. Uh, yeah, and again, that's true, right. And he didn't have a job for a long time, did he? For th well, for 13 years, he was living off his parents' money because he he decided that he wanted to focus on the poor. And that's fine. That's great. But I don't necessarily think that that puts you in touch with the working man. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> with the, uh, yeah. I mean, which is, you know, uh, um, yeah, this guy's um, a piece of work. yeah, this is and 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 the next week. And again, thanks to our, our our colleagues at Twitchy for 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 collating this, for aggregating this. <clears throat> it's not exactly that Fetterman was what the Democratic Party wanted, but per, he was perhaps what they needed. The unicorn who could persuasively pitch policies that would make voters' lives material better while conveying that he was one of them. While living off his parents' <laughs> money and being Jeez. mayor. And then, and then being elected lieutenant governor and treating it like a part-time job for, I, I Penn Live puts the position at two hundred and seventeen thousand a year. I'm not sure if that's accurate. I'd heard one hundred and seventy thousand. Either way, I'm pretty sure that's not in the range that um, most Pennsylvania voters can relate to, especially the part-time nature of it. Can you? I just, it's such abuse, and they get so away with it now if he was a republican yeah if he was a republican he would never would have gotten away with the shotgun incident if he was a republican i mean they'd be spending um millions of dollars pillorying him as a racist interviewing the the man who was chased yeah interviewing the man who was chased and um and and actually the media did that early in the campaign before the before the stroke they did that they've kind of dropped it since then uh because fetterman won the well, in the primary, when he was facing a primary against Connor Lamb, they were bringing this up. Now that the primary is over, they've kind of conveniently dropped that. And I don't know if it's actually in New York Magazine's profile. It may very well be, but it certainly wasn't in their Twitter account <laughs> of, their, no. of, of the profile. No, no. I, and it, it's, it's, it's stupefying is what it is to see the way that they so callously disregard facts and portray their chosen ones as special. And you're going to love this one because I know that you followed this a little bit. You followed the Pennsylvania race and what's going on there. Um, you followed yeah. it a little bit. As summer turned to fall, I think, you know, that's a really nice turn of phrase too, right? As summer turned to fall, uh, somewhere off in the distance, a dog barked. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it was a dark and stormy night. It was a dark and stormy night as summer turned to fall. But as summer turned to fall, Fetterman returned to the trail in person, powering through his convalescence at rallies and via television and newspaper interviews, his physical condition visibly improving. Ahem. <laughs> Nothing's improving wow. on this guy. He really shouldn't even be out on the campaign trail. And, you know, the guy's got more guts than brains, I think, for doing it. He really should have. He really should have withdrawn and let the Democrats put Connor Lamb back in that position um, once he had the stroke. But this is not a guy who's well, he who's wants another job to not show up for. Well, clearly, right? Yeah, I, I and mean, it's what what are senators one hundred and seventy four grand, something like that, something like that. So he can do that part time. Although, to be honest with you, a lot of senators do it part time. <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe it's maybe it fits better, you know, but, you know, when you're there, you're working sometimes 14, 16 hours days. Right. But, you know, there's a lot of times when you're just not there and they work three day weeks, too. So, you know, usually they're they're traveling on Monday and they're traveling on Friday. Um, uh, so it's not all the way from Washington to Pennsylvania. Yeah. Wow. How does well, he I, handle the fatigue? I, I will not ding him for that because there are a number of. There are a number of senators that we could ding on that in both parties. But um, but I mean, the idea that his condition has visibly improved is is laughable. This is a guy who's still ducking a debate with Oz and they started voting in Pennsylvania two weeks ago. <laughs> He's going to oh. do one 
and he wants and he wants a bunch of special conditions so that he can get through it because he's just simply not capable of doing spontaneous debate with Oz at the moment. Uh, he'd be finished. Uh, you know, I did a column a couple of weeks ago about debates and how important they and essentially become in American uh, politics. And it's become, uh, what do you call it, a ruler that y- you you duck it. That's a bad thing. Yep. So the other thing that you can take to the bank on this, um, on this on this profile, and again, this comes right out of uh, New York Magazine's um, uh, Twitter feed. Is this is the this is the resource that, and this brings me to another topic I wanted to discuss with you today too. Uh, this was their uh, their go to source uh, for. Uh, you know, for checking, for corroborating their argument. Oh, yeah. Media matter, Media Matters reported in September that the Fox News primetime lineup mentioned Fetterman more than any other candidate, including those in other hotly contested battles, a metric that illustrates how scared Republicans are about losing this race. This isn't the same uh, profile that calls this the most important race of the mid <laughs> I mean, but Media Matters? <laughs> yeah, right. That's their source. Please. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about media matters because I know they're watching and they're going to get cranky about me anyway. So let's talk about, let's talk about a little bit about media matters. We found something out about David Brock yeah, uh, this week, right? This past week, uh, who, um, you know, media matters. He founded media matters, runs media matters. Um, it turns out that he also runs um, what can best be called alternative media outlets, <laughs> which we might call I don't know, propaganda under, under uh, other conditions. And so one has to ask oneself, is media, <laughs> women, as summer turns to fall, one has to ask <laughs> oneself, Andrew, is media matters really now just a, a way to, to um, rebut the media competition, the reporting competition? I mean... <laughs> Yeah. In any in any universe, wouldn't Media Matters, under the same umbrella with David Brock, be a conflict of interest with the media outlets that they're setting up? These websites that they're setting up as legit media outlets and local markets. I think what was it fifty one of them. Is that amazing. That's just stunning. When I was when I started the uh, the conservative politics blog on the L.A. Times, uh, it was quite a splash. Um, just because the LA Times was it's so unexpected for them to do that. And hats off to them. They had a lot of courage to do it. And Media Matters was sending weekly letters to my direct boss and to the editor of the newspaper. And when I left the paper, they told me that they just formally filed them in the wastebasket. But uh, yeah, it's so it's so predictable. Well, I mean, look, I mean, and I don't want to necessarily make more of the Media Matters, David Brock stuff than than there is, right? Because they're not the only outfit that's out there doing this. Um, there it's are the one we're talking about today, Ed. It so is the one we're talking about today. Yeah. It so is. Knock it out I, of the park. Well, okay. Let me uh, let me put the <laughs> let me put the rosin in my hands. Get get myself right. warmed up for, right. to swing the bat. They're the only ones that I'm aware of that also sets themselves up as a media, um, as a truth in media watchdog, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they're a truth in media watchdog. And at the same time, they're running propaganda under fake, I don't want to say fake news, under alternative news outlets that that don't disclose their connections um, and that connect back up into the same organization. I mean, it's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, perhaps I should, in in full disclosure, Ed, I should disclose that I I have alternate red state accounts who regularly retweet me and and praise my praise my writing. And no, well, maybe, well, I made maybe that up. for even more fuller disclosure, Andrew Malcolm and Ed Morrissey are actually the same person. <laughs> 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 this this whole video is Photoshop. It's a whole thing. The whole thing is just it's a mock-up, right. folks. 
you know, right. it's Andrew and Andrew and I are are the same person. We just happen to be on screen at the very same time. <laughs> and and we're actually on set, and we're uh, right it. We're on yeah. set together. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Andrew, yeah, absolutely. Good to see you <laughs> over there, by the way. <laughs> uh, I, I, we laugh about it, but nothing will ever happen to fix it. It's just, it's just so outrageous. It's so unethical, immoral, yeah. wrong, you name it. But they're the police of the media. Yes. So, all right, let's move on to another topic here. I've got I've got two words for you, Andrew Malcolm. <laughs> Joseph <you>. Robinette Biden. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Uh, yeah, he, and he does this time after time after time. And some outlets like us and you, they write about it and it just goes away. No one does anything about it. No one says should this guy really have access to the nuclear launch codes? I mean, it, time after time, his staff has to come out and clean up what he said. Well, he didn't really mean that. He was exaggerating. Uh, I mean, it's it could be funny if he was vice president even or an obscure senator from the second smallest state. Um, if he's concocting a career as an 18-wheel driver just because he's talking to truck drivers, and then he's concocting a childhood in a Puerto Rican neighborhood when he's talking to Puerto Ricans. Uh, it's just, uh, but no one blows the whistle. Yep. And no one, well, I, the whistle is blown, but no one does anything about the whistle. It's like they just keep on playing on the court. Say, no, no, did you hear the whistle? It's, it's unbelievable to me. Well, uh, you know, um, and I know that you read Issues and Insights. We have friends yes. over at Issues and Insights. Both of us have friends over at Issues and Insights. Yep. Great, great blog. You know, and they work with TIP, or at least they do a lot of analysis with TIP yeah. Yeah. on polling. And um, it was up in our headlines earlier today. Yeah. Uh, we're doing this on Monday, but, um, you know, uh, earlier on Monday, it was up in our headlines about how Democrats are actually now beginning to question um Biden's mental health. And um, this is based on tip polling that they've done. This is actually, a, I think, the second iteration. And yeah. now it's a majority of Democrats are yeah, all 64 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's 64 percent overall. But, overall but, yeah. But 52 percent of Democrats are questioning Biden's uh, mental health. And that's a 13 point increase from um, a couple of months ago. And well, I think know, it, I know. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Go ahead. I noticed that Biden has walked himself back. Remember, as soon as he took office, he was going to run for sure. And I understand politicians have to say that because otherwise right. they'd be lame ducks and, and um, nobody would pay much attention to them because there wouldn't be any punishment if they misbehaved. Uh, but in, uh, where was it? It was in an interview uh, I forget where it was. I've got it in my notes where um, Biden said, well, it was asked about that. And he said, well, oh, it's 60 minutes. I think you, that was, uh, that's my intention. I've said all along, that's my intention to run again, but it's just an intention. And, you know, we'll see what happens in the end. And I haven't heard him say that he's, he was more definitive before right. uh, about, yes, I'm going to do it. And now he's saying his, his intention um, so I think someone's got to him and, you know, he's going to retire to, uh, I don't know, shave his legs in private. It, 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 <laughs> uh, he, uh, um, and the fact of the matter is he's, he, what, he leaves at noon on Friday to go to Delaware where his official guest register is not recorded for public consumption. And then he comes back, we're talking on Monday, he comes back mid-afternoon on Monday. So basically, it's a three-day work week for him. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if they're pumping him up with something in Delaware or if he's just snoozing or, or what he's doing. But uh, it's not, you know, they always say presidents are never off duty. Okay. 
Well, I think a lot of people are happy that he's off duty, especially Democrats, when he's in Delaware and you don't hear from him. You just hear he goes to church and that's it. Yep. By the way, uh, this is breaking as we're as we're talking on Monday afternoon. Jake Tapper is going to do a one on one interview uh, with uh, Joe Biden on CNN primetime um, uh, on Tuesday, October 11th. So this will be this will be the day that we publish this podcast. It will be it will be Tuesday night tonight. Um, so not sure what prompted that. It might have well, been. It's a big so it, they want to have a big name for a splash for his new show. That's well, what it true. Is. I get I mean, I get CNN's into this. I'm not sure what I'm not sure why the White House is putting Joe Biden out there yeah. to do to do, you know, another, you know, uh, three words. And and by the way, gas station owners are evil and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Well, that, we was, that was four days ago. Ed. That was four days. You remember that, was, that line? Oh, yeah. Yeah. People falling so, off airplanes. Yep. Oh, I just it's it. As I, as I said, I think in my column on Sunday, it was, uh, it's one thing if he's a senator from an obscure state yep. or a vice president who was uh, put in the closet, but he's supposed to be commander in chief and his overruling the generals with the Afghan evacuation that cost 13 of us, uh, 13 American service people, yep. their, um, their lives. And Biden was in such a hurry when their bodies came home that he was checking his watch a couple of times. I, uh, it's so respectful. Yep. You know, uh, uh, Bob <clears throat> Gates, Robert Gates, in his book about his working for two different party administrations, said that Joe Biden had a real antipathy to the military. And that, um, and of course, Gates was Secretary of Defense. And um, he was, Biden was the only one who voted against going after uh, bin Laden uh, because he didn't trust the military. And he was always whispering in Obama's ears, according to Gates, uh, you know, don't trust those guys. They have their own agenda, as if Biden didn't or nobody else in Washington had agendas. It's just, I don't know how, yeah. Those, let's see, we had um, three of the last, yeah, three of five, uh, four of the last six presidents. Um, had no military experience, and right. until and until Clinton, everyone did. Every one of them. Uh, yeah, they and, came from, because because they came from a different era. They all came from the World yeah. War II era, right? I mean, they were. They, they, we had we had the draft. Uh, you know, um, and even George W. Bush was he enlist. I mean, most of these guys enlisted. They weren't drafted anyway. But but well, he, you, he yeah. threw F one hundred fours. Right. Yeah. George W. Bush enlisted. Yeah. Absolutely enlisted. Um, and, um, you know, I think after that, he's the last one, I think, with yeah. with um, time in the military. If yeah. I'm if right. I'm... right. Uh, Obama ran against McCain, who obviously had military experience. Um, Joe Biden didn't. And neither did Trump. Neither did so, Trump. Neither. Did, yeah. Yeah. So. So, I mean, look, I mean. It, it was that sort of that World War II era kind of came to an end with Bill Clinton, uh, his election. And with it sort of the, uh, you know, not even the draft, just sort of a cultural yeah. imperative to do military service, right? Um, probably in light of the draft. I mean, you'd rather choose your service than have it cho chosen yeah. for you. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think an element of patriotism, which seems old yep. fashioned to many now, but remember John Kerry, he was doing something. John Kerry, who was in the military, yeah, uh, in Vietnam, and he was doing yeah. some something at some event in Florida years ago. Maybe it was the 2004 campaign, and he made some disparaging remark about, well, if uh, if you have to go in the military, and and to me that indicates. Um, 
an, uh, an attitude, unfortunately, of, yeah. of too many, too many people, not just Democrats, but too many people. Uh, yeah, no, I think that that's a, I think that that's not necessarily even a partisan no, issue, no. you know. Although um, it seems to be dominant. More, more prominent, I should say, in uh, among among Democrats. And remember Obama? Yeah. During during the first campaign, Obama said, "Well, he thought about uh, uh, going in the military, but then he thought better of it." Yeah, yeah. And look, I mean, I think when you're running for president, or if you're running for the Senate too, and and or in Congress, I think you really need to, um, I think you need to frame that better because whether or not you actually would enlist yourself and that's totally fine it's a, it's a it's a free country or at least it used to be and so you can make yeah. your decision as to whether or not to go into there i think the fact that you know you're going to be calling on those military services in congress and as a as president uh to to do certain tasks or at least you have that authority it it pays you to pay respect to them yeah. as you're running and, and as you're serving in those in those offices. And so, yeah, I think you're right about that. Um, so, all right. That brings us, of course, to your we got don't have too many more too much more time, but it does bring us to your um, VIP column this week, which is about um, Joe Biden's new restraints on using WMDs, how that can tempt Putin to nuke Ukraine. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, there's all sorts of there's all sorts of weirdness going on in Russia right now. And I mean, uh, I mean, there isn't a good way out of this war. There are just less bad ways out of this war. Yeah, yeah. And I, I have I, to say, I have to say this. I think Biden's actually done a somewhat competent job of managing the American side of this, but he keeps shooting his mouth off. And again, it's because he doesn't understand, you know, long range strategy at all in any phase, no. but especially in especially in the military. Well. And he was reportedly very angry over his favorite bridge getting blown up uh, over the weekend. Uh, and then so he launched all these missiles on on Ukraine. Yeah, Putin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's um, it's not going well for him. And because this whole decision to invade Ukraine was so cockamamie to begin with that either he was foolhardy uh, or he just flat out believed everything his intelligence services reportedly were telling him. Uh, and apparently we have people inside who are reporting that they were telling him, oh, Ukraine will just fold in days and uh, they, they're, they're just desperate to rejoin Russia and so on. And of course, these seven and a half months have shown that that's the exact opposite. And there are thousands of Russians dead and Ukrainians and billions of dollars spent. Uh, and there's a lot of people, uh, I gather, a growing amount, at least on Twitter, uh, crabbing about giving money to Ukraine. I happen to think that, that, that that's a better than giving our soldiers to the war. Because if, if Putin wins in Ukraine, uh, then he's going to go next door to Poland or Moldova or uh, yep. the Baltic, the Baltic states, uh, and it's not going to end. So if they can, if we, the West, can stop him there, without uh, paying in in our people's blood, just by paying in money by giving the Ukrainians weapons, and nobody's doubting their courage or savvy. Uh, and that's okay with me, but um, uh, he's he's he really has screwed up. And if, if we don't know his mental state, but his back is against the gold walls of the Kremlin, it would seem, and uh, he might be tempted to do something crazy. Uh, and what's happened, what's changed, and this is the crux of the column, is that for all these years of the Cold War since the atomic age began. It's been based on uh, uh, deterrence. It's been based on mutually assured destruction. You start with us, we'll start with you, and nobody's going to win because it will be ashes everywhere. Right. What's changed is we now have smaller nu nuclear weapons. I mean, they're still bad, but they could be in an artillery shell or in, in on the back of a truck. Uh, 
And would the West, would, would NATO respond to Russians using such tactical nuclear weapons uh, in Ukraine, which is not a member of NATO? Yeah. And all the indications are, all the murmurings is that they would not. Uh, and now Putin could easily win the war. Uh, he would make much of Ukraine uninhabitable and the winds as they did with uh, Chernobyl, the winds would take the radiation back into Russia and he would be a pariah, but uh, what would he be a pariah times two now? Uh, so it's, it seems risky and he's openly threatened it. You know, you can't, you can't put much weight on that, but it's on the table anyway, and people are yeah. worried about it. And what's happened now is that according to the, the war games that the U.S. has been playing, uh, we would not respond in kind. Yep. Uh, uh, and uh, that takes away the deterrence on the Western side. And it's kind of like, eh, go ahead, which is what the West let him do when it took over Ukraine, uh, Crimea. That's what the West let him do when he took over two provinces of Georgia. Uh, and uh, it's, this um, appeasement um, doesn't work in the long term. It's unpleasant to be tough. And uh, Obama had been sucking up to Putin for a long time to no avail. And, Putin, and uh, Biden has tried the same. So it's, uh, it's not looking good in that area if it goes that far. No, I agree with you on that. <clears throat> um, all right. Well, I think we're just about ready to wrap that up. But go and check that out over at redstate.com. That's Andrew's latest VIP column. And um, he is the regions of redstate.com. That's and, true. Uh, That's true. Now, and don't you forget it. I've never had. <laughs> I never have because we're actually the same person. Don't forget yeah. we're the same person. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, now, so I, I feel silly asking myself this. No. <laughs> But do yeah. you have jokes of the week? Yes, this week? I do. I do. Oh, there you go. Fact. Okay. These are old jokes, but some of them are still quite timely. Jay Leno, this is an old one. Jay Leno said, the California gas is now over $6 a gallon, the nation's highest. Now, I saw on Twitter today there was over seven in one place. Uh, and Leno says, I have that gas buddy phone app that finds the cheapest gas. I pressed it and it said, stay home, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jimmy Fallon said uh, New York State is spending 750 million dollars on a solar plant in Buffalo thousands of jobs most of them getting snow off the solar panels <laughs> <laughs> seriously <Yeah>. Buffalo <laughs> and finally uh, Jimmy Fallon said uh, China is refusing to broadcast NBA games now after a controversial tweet by the Houston, uh, Houston Rockets GM. It's a bad situation because the NBA needs China to grow its fan base and to make its shoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, true. <laughs> yeah, all true, all to those, those all things true. that are always squeaking. Yeah. Yeah, I have a pair of shoes like that right now. They're always squeaking. I, I feel your pain. Well, when you're going up and down, when you're going up and down the basketball court, Ed, to uh, do do your famous layups. <laughs> <laughs> I am singularly untalented at basketball. Oh, I, I'm me going to tell too. you that right now. Me I, uh, too. I was terrible at it in school. Uh, in fact, I was so bad. <laughs> This in high school, right? My freshman year in high school, we did basketball before we did softball. This and is you're tall. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was a little less, I was, you know, I was still kind of hitting a growth spurt at that point in time. And, um, but I mean, I was completely bad at that game. And it was the first game we played in PE, right? That for that year, it was the first game right, we played. Right. And I missed the first quarter of PE because I was in marching band. And so I came in the second quarter, they're playing basketball, right? So this is like, you know, October through December. And because it's Southern California, the weather's nice. So I think the very next thing we did was softball. You know, the very next sport we played in PE was softball. Yeah. I got picked last for that team based on how I would I played basketball. And I actually can play. <laughs> <laughs> I can actually play baseball. And um, so, yeah, I got picked last. And I was like, well, well, whatever, whatever. I don't really care. 
And um, the first time I was up at bat, I, I just drilled this thing. I must've drilled it like about 300 feet. Oh, and, and, um, and uh, after that, I, I got picked not yeah, last. Yeah, I, I get an <laughs> extension on his contract. <laughs> yeah, you I know what I love? I, I, uh, it, what I love is the ad with Charles Barkley. And he's in a pickup game on a playground with all kids. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, the, and the little girl says, okay, uh, Barkley. And he goes, yes, yes, first pick. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a Geico commercial. They say some decisions are easy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just, I just, I just love that because he's so, he's so, so competitive. So all these little kids who are half his height and he's surprised and delighted to be picked. Barkley is hilarious. Barkley is absolutely hilarious. I love Barkley. Barkley is hilarious. I, I, you know, I lived in Phoenix. He was with the Suns when I was living in Phoenix and the People there just loved Barkley because he really fit the whole Phoenix sort of gestalt, right? Yeah, just yeah. didn't really give a crap. <laughs> just yeah. said whatever was on his mind, didn't really give a crap. And still to this day is like that. All right. Yeah. You're you're getting paged, uh, my liege. Uh, the prince of Twitter is getting paged. Yeah, I must on, let please. you go. Andrew Malcolm, Prince of Twitter, have yep. yourself a great week. We'll back we'll be back with you next week. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show. I am very honored to introduce to you again, uh, Ambassador Francis Rooney, uh, former representative in, in the House, uh, still in Florida and made it through the Hurricane OK, which is always good news. And he's got a new piece up at the Hill as we're talking about this, uh, uh, or not necessarily a new piece, but a, a piece on the Hill that he wrote quite a while back, uh, which I think has been prescient. Um, Ambassador Rooney in exactly in stating exactly where we were at then and why we've got the same options in front of us right now. So first off, welcome back and tell us a little bit about um, your your position here on Russia. Well, thanks for having me back on. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I think Putin's aggression was uh, exacerbated by previous presidents' uh, appeasement of him. Right. I mean, Obama even joked about. Crimea. Now the joke's on Obama. And uh, Putin looks at this old guy, Biden, and says, wow, this is a good time to strike. And I can't say that I blame him, given his, given his perspective and what he's written about what he wants to do, because I think he thinks he's Peter the Great. Well, I think he wants to be Peter the Great. I think it's his aspiration. And I think one of the things that people forget, and a whole series of presidents have forgotten this. I mean, George W. Bush forgot it. Um, Barack Obama certainly forgot it, even though he had ample evidence to the contrary. Donald Trump, to a certain extent, forgot it. And Joe Biden, I'm sure, ever knew it. Uh, but <laughs> Russian imperialism runs very, very deep in the Russian psyche. And it's expressed itself in different ways during the, uh, the during the czarist era. It was, you know, czarist territorial expansion. Um, during the Soviet era, it was, you know, supposedly the expansion of communism for the benefit of the world, but it was basically dressed up Russian imperialism. And I think for some reason, maybe people read Francis Fukuyama a little too um, literally, and they thought that the collapse of the Soviet Union had ended that. That's not the case. And Vladimir Putin's rise to power in the first place is a pretty is a pretty good testament to just how enduring that Russian imperialism really is. Well, I think that's right. It's kind of like the leopard and the spots. The Slavic right. mentality has been the Slavic mentality since wherever that guy was, Ivan, in, in the 6th century, and then the Muscovite rebellion in the 16th, 17th century. They're, they are what they are, and they have a Slavic paranoia about the West. They feel mistreated by the West, second cousins, if you will. They want to be Europeans, but they don't. And all that's playing out in, in Putin's ambitions here. Yeah. And I, when you understand that, and I think we should have understood that when the Russians invaded Georgia, by the way. Um, yeah. I mean, that was really the wake up call. And and to George Bush's credit, it was his wake up call, but he, he only had like five months left in office. And we had an economic crisis that erupted about the same time. Um, 
but nobody else should have been, I mean, the scale should have been off of everybody's eyes at that point in time, but there is just something, I don't know if it's Putin or if it's just the unwillingness to face up to a threat, the threat that Russia has, uh, you know, has always actually been, but no one has wanted to deal with it. And, you know, you can go back to the 2012 election, Ambassador Rooney, when Mitt Romney was making the point, well, our number one geopolitical foe is really Russia. And Barack Obama scoffed at that and said, you know, the, the 80s called, they want their foreign policy back. Um, I, I mean, it's just astounding how many how much denial has gone into this, not just in the United States, but in, across the West. Well, with both Russia and China, what is it about Americans yeah. that we always think if we're nice to people, they're going to want to be like us? They're not. They're totally different cultures. And this Slavic thing, uh, I know there are a lot of people in the State Department and the agency and stuff that understand the cultural background of this, but sometimes they don't get heard. Right. Right. And I think that's important to recognize, too, is that, you know, there's there's always a mix of um, there's always a mix of opinions and, and outlooks and, and analyses at um, in the State Department and elsewhere. But it really it is depending on. I think in large part on who's telling the president what he wants to hear. <laughs> exactly. And it's just a lot easier for presidents if they don't have to think of Russia and China's geopolitical foes. Uh, it makes their job easier. And so I think presidents of both parties have been inclined to just accept that. I, and I think that maybe nobody can make that mistake from this point forward. Um, but I think that there is still some denial out there. And I think this is what your column was addressing back in March. I think it's what you're talking about now um, is that there's still some denial here. And the fact of the matter is, is that we're Putin is a geopolitical foe and we have to treat him that way. We have to prepare ourselves for that. Exactly. And I think the more pressure we put on them economically, the better, because it's a non-military force coupler that can right. maybe provoke some kind of change. I mean, there's so many oligarchs who are being aggrieved now by our restrictions. Any of them could cut a billion dollar check to a Wagner type and go try to get the, this guy out if they could get to him. Well, that's, I mean, that brings up a, a whole host of other questions. I mean, when you wrote that column, did you expect to see Ukraine still in the field and and actually pushing Russians back because, I mean, I kind of hoped that that would be the case. And I suspected that the Russian military was a lot more rotten than what people had assessed, because we kind of figured that out in the, so in the later Soviet era, too. But, you know, you never know. <laughs> and they still have new, you know, they still have, you know, nuclear weapons, tactical and strategic. Uh, so you can't just write them off. But still, I mean, I'm surprised. I was surprised that the Ukrainians have been able to do as well as they did. I think the whole world has been surprised at how poorly the Russians organize a battlefield, how poorly they contest the Ukrainians, how poorly their equipment works. And now with this next two or three hundred thousand conscripts that they've drugged out of winos and, and uh, jails, we'll see what happens. I think they're all going to get mowed down. Well, Ambassador Rooney, I think that that's a that's almost a given. I mean, they're conscripting people from anti-war protests. And, you yeah. know, I'm not a I'm not a big conscription fan anyway. But when you have like a legal draft that's in place, it's stable. You know, you got the selective service regime and there's 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 a stability to it. You know, Israel has a compulsory national service. I think Finland does as well. Uh, Iceland, I think, even has a compulsory com compulsory national service. When you have that sort of thing going on, there's a there's kind of stability to it that you can rely on. But this is not it. And this, to me, is almost a situation where what you're going to end up doing is you're going to have large scale mutinies in the Russian military for by forcing people onto the front lines that don't want to be there. I mean, I think this is actually maybe going to work out worse for the Russians than what their status quo is at the moment. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. The, the, the worst case is they get shot by Ukrainians. Best case is they run away and get out to Poland or somewhere. Well, I think the, I think the worst case for the Russians is that they turn their guns around to start shooting their commanders and then yeah, run, <laughs> and then run out. Problem. Yeah. Yeah. Then you'll yeah. have all kinds of Russian genocide going. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is, 
But I mean, so this calls into question what we do next, right? Because this is clearly a destabilizing situation. And when you're dealing with a large scale nuclear power, really, honestly, the last thing you want to see is is large scale destabilization. Um, it's it's a scary thing. And while all of us think, uh, you know, boy, it'd be great if they pushed Putin out. And you were just mentioning this, you know, oligarchs spend a billion dollars, give it to the Wagner group and Prigozhin um, goes in and knocks them off. And somebody takes over. The problem is, is A, it's not as it, it may not be that easy to do that, but B, what comes next? And that has got to be something that's keeping people awake at night at the State Department right now. Yeah, but it's hard to think that they would come up with two people as qualified, trained and wily and and, and lethal as Putin. I mean, what are we documented right. over 60 people he's approved poisoning of? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a guy who knows how to take care of his um, enemies. There's no doubt about that. Um, there's been a lot of talking. We hear Joe Biden talk about this last night, uh, right before he decided to take a vacation in Delaware again. That we're on the edge of Armageddon. By the way, I'm taking the weekend off. Um, <laughs> I think it's good that Biden takes vacations. He can't do any harm when he's up there in Delaware. There's a there's a story someplace in scripture about a king that slept in it till midday and a prophet told him, you know, for the for the, you know, basically for the time that you're sacking out, and not afflicting yourself on others. It's a blessing. I, I forget <laughs> where it's at. I actually read that in all places in Peanuts, you know, by Charles Schultz. Um, but I'm, that's always stuck with me. Yeah, there's some people who you really would prefer to be dilettantes. Unfortunately, Putin's not really that guy, but um so what what do you do? Uh, Biden is, though, however, um, what is the proper response now? I mean, you you have Putin who's, you know, actually explicitly mentioned nuclear weapons as a potential option here. You've got um, all sorts of instability here. If you were advising the president, well, let's just say a generic president. <laughs> advising a generic president in this case ambassador rooney what 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 steps would you take at this point to to firm up opposition and deter the use of those weapons i i would call for um some type of peace conference maybe like yeah. the old north korea one you know and i would make sure that germany france and england are all there with us it just can't be Zelensky because he's not going to give an inch. We're going to have right. to have the Western powers get with Russia and solve this thing. And Russia's going to have to get something. Yeah, oh, you know, that's. Sorry. And here's the here's the the rub on that one is that if he gets anything that he that he um, didn't have at the start of the war, you really are, in a sense, rewarding um a war of a, a roar of territorial aggression, right? Because this was not yeah. a provoked war. This is he wanted Ukraine and it was an invasion. Uh, yeah, it was an invasion. On the other hand, I'm not necessarily sure that um that you're right. I don't think he'll quit uh, without having something. And right now he's at risk of losing what he what he controlled before the war. I mean Well, that's the good thing that Zelensky's turning our our mid-range missiles on Crimea. Maybe the answer is to let Zelensky beat up Crimea a little bit, then have a peace conference and say, OK, well, let's keep Crimea. Although I don't know if you get Zelensky to do that without the Western powers uh, enforcing it. Yeah, I think that I think at that point, if Zelensky was going to do that at all, I think he would want a military alliance um, with with the West to enforce it. And we've been yeah. for, for very good reasons reluctant to do that because. We don't want to. We don't want to grant Ukraine Article Five status in the middle of a war with Russia. That's right. how you he may be the non NATO NATO guy, right? Um, but but with that said, I think I think Zelensky has a problem here too, which is that you know you've seen all these atrocities. The Ukrainians are very now well aware of all these atrocities in the in the liberated areas, and that creates two problems for him. One is what's going on in the areas that they haven't been able to liberate yet and and how do you stop atrocities from taking place in those areas and two you still have the michael collins issue right you know the the irish freedom fighter who decided that it would be best to cut a deal with the united kingdom to to settle matters so you could get peace and and move on with life and uh, unfortunately somebody moved him on from life 
uh, right. his own side, right? And that's, I think, the issue that Zelensky has now is is the Michael Collins issue. Yeah, it's tough to be a peacemaker in the middle of a war, for sure. Yeah. It's a high risk move. Someone might want to take him out. But at the end of the day, we, we've got to somehow figure out a framework for discussing how to end this thing. And it can't just be Zelensky and the Russians. I don't think it can be. I don't think it's possible for it to be Zelensky and the Russians. It's going to require probably China on Russia's side and then mm -hmm. yeah. the EU and the U.S. on mm -hmm. Zelensky's side. Um, and I guess let's let's talk about China in in this context, because I think that China and India were two countries that Putin was trying to rely on commercially, certainly, in the face of all these sanctions. And I think they've been pretty open with it. I think they've been open to that, open to commercial transactions to allow him to avoid the sanctions in the West. But he was also relying on them diplomatically for cover in this. And both of them have, in their own ways, made it clear that they are not on board with his war in Ukraine. Um, is there an opening there, you know, maybe... I think it would have to be China. Is there an opening there where she and Modi are going to uh, be able to tell Putin, you need to stop this right now. You need to let us get you the best deal you can possibly get and get, get the hell out. I think it would be difficult because of the uh, energy sales. I mean, China is buying a lot of their oil from Russia. I don't think they're, they're, they would go that far. I think they would probably yeah. sit down multi-party talks. But I don't think they're going to be pushing Putin around. I don't know that then that you get that to work. I think it, it, the final question here is based on what you know uh, of the of the situation in Russia, can Putin survive without? I, I mean, if he ends up with nothing more than Donetsk and Crimea at the end of this, I mean, it will be a lot of people who died for nothing, right. uh, literally nothing. Can he survive that in in Russia, or is it, or is he just is he well protected enough to where he can pretty much dictate whatever he wants to do and and still write it out? He's probably pretty wrapped up, you know. There is that doctrine that you can get anybody anywhere if you have enough time and money to yeah, do it. He wrote that doctrine. Yeah, <laughs> he wrote that. Doctrine. He's got to be pretty wrapped up. I wouldn't be surprised if people have already come after him with all the havoc that's been wreaked among the. Uh, oligarchs and and the more the russian people miss their big macs and their handbags and all the stuff they got used to and cars that are better than lotta's you know there, right. there could be some problems for him there could be a lot of people that want to deal with him well i think also the the mobilization right the the partial mobilization was a really destabilizing event you've seen how many people run for the borders there yes you talk about you talk about mcdonald's I'm talking about Taco Bell. You got Russians making a run for the border everywhere in the oh, country. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I saw those aerial photos of the roads. They're all going only going one way. Right. Yeah. So and he's kind of in a box canyon. He does there's and that's a little scary to have a uh, a losing cornered Putin with tactical and other nuclear weapons. That's a little scary position that we're in here. Very scary position. Uh, all right. So, uh, Ambassador Rooney, what else have you got coming up? What else are you working on? Well, I've, I've been working a lot on Latin America lately. I'm involved with the Wilson Center and the uh, Inter-American Dialogue. And, you know, Latin America has taken a very strange turn. I did a talk last night to a bunch of young people at AEI. In the 70s, we had military dictatorships. In the 90s, we had elected quasi-democratic leaders. Now, in the 2010s, we have so-called elected authoritarians, yep. mostly from the liberal end of things. So we've had three different types of government over third, three generations. None of them have improved a lot of the people enough to have stability. Yeah, you know, I, I, I did notice a few years ago that Daniel Ortega was back in Nicaragua and, and is still there. Uh, and is still Daniel Ortega uh, in the, you know, it's the same incarnation of Daniel Ortega as it always was. Um, you've got Maduro in Venezuela, who now Biden wants to work with on oil. Because, Horrendous mistake. Horrendous yeah. mistake. Uh, you know, it's just, it's unbelievable how how boxed, he, he boxed himself into that. 
by cutting off American oil production. Yeah, and they weighed eliminating- more on the oil and gas industry for three years, drove all the capital out of it. There's less drilling and less production. And now they're going to go to Venezuela? Yeah. For for sulfurous crude, which requires a lot more refining, which requires, you know, which is worse for the climate. It's worse. <laughs> it's actually worse, it's worse for, for the, the climate. climate. But it does, it does happen that we have the big Sitco refinery at Corpus Christi the yep. big Sitka refinery at Lake Charles that can deal with Venezuelan crude from the old days. Right. Still in operation. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes. Um, another time we should probably talk about um, strategic uh, use of oil in uh, for, uh, you know, American security. But we'll save that one for another time. Ambassador Francis Rooney, thank you so much for being with us today. Great conversation and uh, best of luck to you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for watching or listening to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. You can subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and through the Town Hall Media Player, or you can just come to hotair.com and watch my podcast for free. However, I'd also love to have you join us as members of our VIP and VIP Gold programs. That allows us to defeat the stranglehold that big tech has on information and get you the best information that we possibly can. Plus, we have a lot of new value-added content coming to us from Town Hall Media uh, stars and my good friend Adam Baldwin. He and I are doing the video series, The Amiable Skeptics. It's one hour of discussion a week strictly for our VIP and VIP Gold members. Plus, we have our VIP Gold Chat with Kim Edwards every Wednesday afternoon at 1.30 p.m. We'd love to have you as members. Be sure to join up. Thanks again for watching the Ed Morrissey Show podcast.